In 1861, an amateur photographer took a self-portrait. Later, when he developed the photograph, he was astonished to find that he was not the only person visible in the portrait. Sitting in the chair next to him was the hazy, translucent figure of his cousin who had died 12 years earlier. Hey y'all, I'm Christina and you're listening to History and Hearsay. In the mid-1800s, technological breakthroughs like photography and the telegraph revolutionized the world. For the first time, people could see true-to-life depictions of loved ones who weren't there and receive messages from hundreds of miles away in mere seconds. During the antebellum period, people were highly superstitious and with all of these technological advances happening so quickly, people began to think of them as being sort of supernatural. In a previous video, we actually talked about death photography. You can go and check that out here. But in that video, we discussed how high mortality rates during the Victorian era contributed to the practice of taking photos of dead loved ones. And in a similar fashion, when spirit photography appeared in the 1860s, the United States was reeling from the Civil War. Deep in mourning, Americans were drawn to anyone who offered them even a fleeting connection to the souls of their dearly departed. And this is what American historian and author Peter Mansu believes laid the groundwork for a new religious movement known as spiritualism that was gaining popularity in the U.S. and in Europe. The principal belief of spiritualism was that contact with the dead was possible if you had the right means. That connection was made through a medium, which you may know is a person who claims they can communicate with the dead. Now, from the very beginning, many people suspected spiritualist mediums to be fraud. Still, the movement grew to include thousands and by some accounts, possibly millions of Americans in the late 19th century. So when an unknown amateur photographer in Boston began and developing photos that apparently included apparitions of the dead, it attracted the attention of the spiritualists. The story goes that sometime in the early 1860s, William Mumler, who was an engraver by trade, started tinkering with photography in a Boston studio that was owned by his friend, Hannah Stewart. Hannah, who would eventually become William's wife, was a professional photographer who also claimed to be a spiritualist medium. One day, Mumler decided to try his hand at taking a self portrait. And to his astonishment, when he developed the photograph, he was not alone. The apparition of a young girl appeared beside him. A young girl who Mumler exclaimed bore an uncanny resemblance to his cousin who had died 12 years prior. Now during this time in early photography, photos were taken by using glass plates that had been coated with emulsions to capture light and and eventually show an image once the developing process was complete. These emulsions were not as light sensitive as the equipment we have today, and so they required very long exposure times, which meant that the subject of the photo had to stay incredibly still for about 45 to 60 seconds. If they moved at all, the photo would come out blurred. And so this is the way that most of the original ghost or spirit photographs were taken accidentally. Like the one I'm showing you now, this is an 1854 photo of Prince Arthur that was taken by Roger Fenton. You see the ghostly figure of the prince nurse like reaching out to touch him. It appears as though the nurse maybe was a little bit nervous about how they had Prince Arthur propped up on a box like posed to take a picture and maybe she was worried that he was going to fall off and so she stepped into the frame to steady him and this of course led to her being captured during the long exposure. However, when Mumbler's photo was taken, he insists that he was very much alone in the studio. He claimed to have been completely astonished when his cousin appeared. It's said that a spiritualist friend of Mumbler's saw the photo and confirmed that it was in fact a ghost that he had managed to capture on film. Now, there are some conflicting details about who released the photo to the press, but Mumler's photo was written up in a popular spiritualist newspaper known as Banner of Light, and also mainstream media caught wind of it and reported on the story as well. Mumler became an overnight sensation as Bostoners began flocking to the small portrait studio for the chance to get a photo of their deceased loved ones. At a time when it cost about $1 to get your portrait made, Mumler's able to charge up to $10 
$1,000 for one of his spirit photographs. Mumbler sold himself as someone who couldn't explain what was happening or why he was chosen to take these pictures. And he was just astonished as everyone else when his camera suddenly started taking pictures of ghosts. Mumbler seemed to build his credibility in the beginning by insisting that he could not guarantee anyone that they would get a picture with the ghost. He said he didn't command the spirits and they came and went as they pleased. And sometimes he would take a photo for someone and no spirit would be captured. But over time it said that if someone came in for one of these spirit photos and it didn't come out how they wanted, Mumler would kind of help the person to research their memory for other spirits that might be showing up. So if someone came in wanting a picture of their dead brother but an old lady appeared in the photo he might help remind them that oh didn't you have an old great aunt and didn't she wear her hair like that in a bun and since photography was so new it was fairly simple to get away with something like this no one really had anything else to compare the blurry images to and as word spread Mumler's hobby became a lucrative business and he was soon taking spirit photographs from dusk until dawn summoning lost loves and offering some level of solace to a public ravaged by the rising death toll of the Civil War. And these ghostly renderings became so popular that spiritualists held these photographs as scientific evidence of their beliefs. Since not everyone could make it to his Boston studio, Mumbler found a way to expand his operation to include a mail-in service. Send a description of the spirit you hope to see, plus $7.50, and you too could get a photo with your loved one's ghost. But despite all of his fans, Mumbler's spirit photography also attracted skeptics from the very start. Now today we might think of it, things like Photoshop as being relatively new, but manipulating photos was actually done from the very inception of photography. And many photographers were openly experimenting with double exposures and superimposed negatives, all of the things that could possibly have created the same effect that Mumbler was getting in his spirit photography. Many of these photographers were either skeptical they didn't like that he was trying to trick people or they just wanted to know his secrets for themselves because they were photo nerds like that or something. One day, a veteran Boston photographer, J.W. Black, arrived at Mumbler's studio and demanded a demonstration. He sat for a portrait and carefully watched every step of Mumbler's process, including the alchemy of the darkroom. It's even said that Black insisted on carrying the glass to the darkroom himself so he could ensure there was no trickery going on. Black was a renowned photographer who was credited for taking the very first aerial photographs. By the time Mumbler began gaining popularity, Black had already been in this field for decades and he seemed determined to prove that William Mumler was a fraud. Now I do think, interesting side note, it said that people really didn't care whenever Black first came out with aerial photos. He was somehow getting these overhead shots with balloons, which granted in that time would have been like pretty spectacular, you know, basically a drone shot back in the 1800s, but people didn't really see, see the benefit in it. They were like, oh great, now I get to see our farm from up high. Like I could have gotten in a tree and done that, right? Like people just didn't understand his genius. So part of me wonders if that's why he was a little bit annoyed with William Mumler because he's like, all these people are flocking to him. They think this guy is like an amazing genius. And meanwhile, I've created something that's actually great and nobody sees the value. I don't know. That's just my own opinion. Maybe that had nothing to do with it. But as historian Peter Mansu describes in his book, Black watched as his own dark outline appeared on the glass. It's form not unlike the photographs he'd taken of himself seated with his newspaper. But then another shape began to appear and Black said, my God, is it possible? The shape took a ghostly form of a man standing behind Black's shoulder. Was it his father who had died when Black was 13? Black didn't stick around to explain. He offered to pay for the print, in which Mumbler politely refused, and so Black left the studio clutching the photograph. And so while incredibly he had managed to convince Mr. Black, other things started happening that would start bringing Mumbler's credibility into question. First, he created a spirit photograph for a woman who had recently lost her brother in the Civil War. But then shortly after, her brother actually miraculously returned home alive. Now, fortunately for Mumbler, this woman actually didn't blame him at all. She said, oh no, that was just an evil spirit that was trying to deceive me. Then there was the case of a man who visited Mumbler's studio and he actually recognized one of the ghosts in Mumbler's photo that he had taken for someone else. And it was his wife, but his wife was 
still alive, and she had recently had her portrait taken by Mumbler. So it seemed very obvious to his skeptics that he was simply reusing old negatives and playing them off as ghosts. In 1869, Mumbler moved his business from Boston to New York. Some say this was because of his great success, but others say he was basically run out of town by the negative accusations against him. Either way, once in New York, Mumbler came under the scrutiny of the mayor who sent a reporter to visit Mumbler's new studio under the guise of being a customer. During this visit, Mumbler produced a ghost in the reporter's portrait and identified the face as the father-in-law of the reporter. However, the reporter's father-in-law was still alive and bore no resemblance to the spirit that was in the portrait. Mumbler was consequently charged with fraud. The New York prosecutors called a parade of expert witnesses who offered at least nine different ways that Mumbler could have used photographic trickery to produce his ghostly images. The prosecution brought in P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth as a key witness, and this guy was a self described expert of Humburg. Now this guy was actually credited with being the one who coined the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. Now, P.T. Barnum always had a problem with spiritualists because he felt that they were taking advantage of people's grief and he just felt as though that was going too far. So as evidence that this was all done with some sort of photographic trickery, Barnum commissioned a fake photograph of himself with the ghost of President Abraham Lincoln. But when he presented this as evidence to the jury of how easily these kind of photos could be faked, the jury was not convinced. You see, several of the prosecution's experts had gone to Mumbler's studio to observe his entire process and not one of them could specifically say, this is exactly what Mumbler did and I saw him do it. Instead, the prosecution merely provided nine possible ways that Mumbler could be creating these photos. And they theorized that Hannah, you know, the original friend turned wife, she was somehow involved. They thought maybe she was possibly distracting people so that he could do whatever tricks he was doing while they were in there. Now, to this day, no one has ever been able to say for sure how Mumbler created his photos because he insisted for the rest of his life that his photos were authentic. And he said they simply proved the existence of an afterlife. But when researching possible ways that this could have been done, the most straightforward theory seems to be a combination of a photographic trick mixed with a little sleight of hand whenever there were skeptics there watching. I'm going to link a video for you guys if you're more interested on that process that was done by Vox and it shows this entire method, but it was basically just a process that involved taking a regular portrait with no ghost, which is what people would have observed Mumbler doing, and then taking a separate piece of glass with the negative of the ghost, which which would have been a photo he had previously already taken, and then lining the two negatives up to create the final photo. So of course there were many ways that Mumbler could have faked the photos, but no one had ever caught him in the act or provided concrete evidence that he used any of these methods. And the method that I just described was not listed as one of the nine theories put forward by the prosecution. The defense argued that human ingenuity can do all these things that just a generation ago would have seemed like sheer magic. They were basically like, who can say that we can't photograph spirits? A few years ago, we would have thought taking pictures at all was impossible. Mumbler's trial concluded with him being acquitted because the judge determined that the prosecution had failed to prove beyond a doubt that Mumbler was knowingly fabricating his spirit photographs. Despite being acquitted on the fraud charges, Mumbler's reputation was ruined and he left his studio in New York to return to Boston. Some say that he shied away from spirit photography at this point, but clearly he hadn't yet hung his head up for good because in the early 70s, he welcomed none other than Mary Todd Lincoln, the widow of the President Abraham Lincoln. Mary had experienced quite a bit of loss over the last several decades. In 1850, her son Eddie died at the age of three. In 1862, her son Willie died at age 11. Mary, of course, took the death of her children very hard. And it's said that she turned to spiritualism and mediums after Willie's death. Her faith in spiritualism was said to have grown even stronger following the murder of her husband in 1865. And her faith grew even stronger in 1871 when her youngest son, Tad, died 
died at the age of 18. Seven months later, she visited Mumbler's studio. And despite the accusations of fraud against him and other spiritual mediums, Americans, like the former first lady, still deep in mourning, seem to want to believe. Mumbler's photo of Mary Todd Lincoln was the last one taken in her life when her photo was developed and her husband appeared behind her with his hand on her shoulder. It seemed to give Mary a great sense of comfort. Historian Manso says no one could dissuade her that it did not mean that Abraham Lincoln was still by her side. The final years of Mary Lincoln's life were defined by unthinkable loss and grief and the depression that followed. She was vulnerable and longing to reconnect with her husband and children who had been taken from her. Within a month of having taken that photograph, Mumbler had sent a copy to the Boston Herald along with a letter where he claims that he didn't know at first who the subject was when she came into his studio. And he basically said like, you can judge who you think this image is behind her, but the woman fully recognized the picture. Now many find the fact that Mumbler did this photo for Mary Tyler Lincoln to be a bit ironic given the fake that was used to try and condemn him in court had also been the ghost of Lincoln. As I mentioned before, Mumbler insisted for the rest of his life that his photos were authentic and simply proved the existence of an afterlife. In the opening line of his memoir, published in five different parts in the Banner of Light publication in 1875, he wrote that his spirit photographs contributed evidences of a future existence, and though prosecuted, he was satisfied at having been a humble instrument in the hands of the invisible host that surround us. Once Mumbler finally did move on from spirit photography, he refocused his efforts on the chemistry of photo development, and he eventually invented a process called the Mumbler process that allowed the first photographs to be printed on newspapers, which transformed the practice of journalism. But this was not enough to rebuild his demolished finances, and in 1884, he was said to have died in poverty at the age of 52. So what do you guys think? Do you think this guy really set out to make a quick buck while exploiting people? Or was he doing a good thing by kind of just giving people some level of peace? While the credit or blame, depending on how you look at it, has always been placed on William, many now believe that Hannah was actually the mastermind behind all of this. Since she was the one who was a professional photographer at the time all this started, she was also a spiritualist and she was the one that was believed to have taught William photography. Historian Mansu says, Mumbler was surely a fraud, although he doesn't know exactly how the photographer managed to do his trick. He does note that he doesn't discount the healing function that spiritualism served. I do think it's possible this all started out as an accident. Maybe he didn't clean off the glass well and he re-exposed an old image behind his new image. And then maybe his girlfriend slash wife Hannah was the one who came up with this entire scheme since she was the one who was the spiritualist to begin with. A lot of people get upset when they think about this kind of thing and they see it as exploiting other people's grief, which I agree that's it's never okay, but part of me kind of feels like these photos probably really did bring a lot of comfort to people during a time when they were really grieving. So, and I mean, maybe if they were spending money they didn't have, but I kind of think like if they had the money to get the photo and it gave them that much comfort, was it really hurting anyone? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And until next time, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay.